This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I would like to announce uh, our speaker for today, uh, Maurice Gunderson. He's a senior partner at uh, CMEA uh, Ventures, one of the you know, really one one of the most um, Im important and successful venture firms uh, in technology. And he, in particular, focuses on energy investments. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you and to have you here. Thank you, thank you, Burkhardt, and. and uh, also, uh, Iklok, I really appreciate the uh, invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thanks very much. Um, I'll, uh, uh, I'd like to cover four or five different points uh, today. Um, first of all, I'll tell you what my view of the opportunity set in the energy uh, uh, sector is, at least as far as venture capital fundable and funded opportunities. I'll talk about um, the venture capital industry, how it's structured, and how that relates to the kind of deals we can and cannot do. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some war stories, uh, uh, companies that we funded com that have done well, some that have not done well, some that may do uh, very well about this time tomorrow, and then a few suggestions uh, for any of you who are interested in the energy sector, especially startups. Um, I'll start, though. Um, complying with the request that, uh, that Ikla gave. Um, I've, I've never, actually never done this uh, in the probably hundreds of presentations I've given. He said, uh, tell us about you. How did you get here? Well, that's a good question. I actually hadn't thought of it in, in those terms. So uh, it took me a while to put together a slide on the matter. So here we are. I boiled it down to four uh, main bullet points. Um, in the beginning, I was born. Um, that's pretty much at the start. Um, the point of this is that um, I came from a pretty rural place, uh, first uh, Kodiak Island in Alaska and then, then rural Oregon. My dad was an engineer, my mom was a teacher. Uh, you know, I had interests that all kids did or, uh, you know, in, 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 in high school, you know, cars, music, so on. Um, aviation, craftsmanship, mathematics, and above all, um, you know, the time that I was growing up was on a oval black and white screen, projects Mercury, uh, Gemini, and Apollo. I remember think, sitting there in the middle of uh, um, Eastern Oregon uh, on the one TV station that we got all the way from Redding with rabbit ears, um, seeing the snowy images and thinking, wow, uh, that's something I got to be involved in. Um, and I can tell you that. Um, the, the upbringing I had was, uh, you know, very, very valuable. I got a great education from two very well-educated and uh, um, attentive parents. But one thing I didn't get, they were both civil servants. Uh, my dad worked for a utility district. My mom was a teacher. Most of their friends had similar kinds of jobs. And we really didn't pal around with people in the business world. So when I left, to go to college, and actually when I got out of college with a master's degree in engineering uh, five years later, I really didn't have a viewpoint as to the role that business played in building the economy, if you can believe it. So I um, graduated with a uh, Bachelor of Arts and Master of Science and uh, went out to change the world as an engineer. And uh, moved to Los Angeles and joined the aircraft industry. What else would somebody who was fascinated with the space, uh, space uh, program do in 1974? There still was a little bit of the space industry at the time. Um, I actually got a couple of very lucky breaks. I was working at a, a big aerospace systems house uh, that made uh, uh, pressurization systems, uh, de-icing systems, and all that for aircraft. And along came Jimmy Carter with the moral equivalent of war um, speech. And if you could type and you could spell energy, 
you could get a proposal funded. So the company I was working for, which was called uh, Garrett Air Research, decided that they were going to do that and figure out ways to get funded programs to take their aerospace technology into the commercial market. So we dreamt up all kinds of alternative energy things, uh, solar power generators of different kinds, solar powered um, cookie bakers for Nabisco, all kinds of stuff, desalination, so on and so on. The saying, of course, that we came up with real quick was that you could tell in the first five minutes of calculation that the thing would work, the second five minutes of calculation that nobody would ever buy it because ele uh, electricity and petroleum were too cheap. But nonetheless, the government was paying. And so that's where I really got an, an education, if you will, in the, the potential and the history of, um, of alternative energy. Um, I also worked in a company that made some uh, uh, oil well service equipment. The other lucky break I got in that whole engineering career was I happened to work for three companies in a row, the aircraft one, another, and, and then two others, that had just come out of what I would call their entrepreneurial phase, and they had, where the founders had been heavily involved in the business. And they hadn't yet moved into the bureau, bureaucratic phase where all of that was forgotten, but the trend was that way. And so, you know, for the first time in my life, I could see, you know, just connecting the dots uh, 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 related to the actions of people around me, entrepreneurs really did this. You know, individual people fought this up and created these companies. Uh, the air aircraft company that I worked for was the 10th largest employer on the West Coast at the time. This was a big deal and, you know, was started by one guy. So, um, you know, I, I, I realized that and then I realized that, uh, you know, this sure is fun, but the pay sure is lousy. I see um, the people that started companies, the people in management and so on, making a lot more money than me. And so with no more analysis than that, I applied to business school. Uh, now, I don't think at the time I even knew anybody who had an MBA. Or if they did, they never talked about it. Um, but it seemed like a good idea at the time, so I... Um, kind of ended that engineering career after 11 years, um, going off to get a, an MBA across the other side of the bay at Stanford. And so then, of course, I went out to change the world again, uh, this time as an entrepreneur. So um, started a bunch of companies, a total of nine. Uh, uh, apartment management companies, uh, uh, um, uh, real estate development, uh, you know, if you have apartment buildings and you find out that people steal the light bulbs and that leads you to invent vandal-resistant light fixtures and so on and so on and so on. Um, and I also um, bought a little company that was about out of business in the aircraft and automotive test uh, business, grew that, sold it to British Aerospace. And um, the education I got in that was, first of all, I found out that the, the engineering part of any job was the easy part. The everything else was the really hard part, especially cash management. So I say, you know, this is where I got a kind of a loosely organized, without a syllabus, uh, PhD in cash management, and uh, realized that I could help other people start companies too. So in 1992, I get up, I, you know, once again, out to change the world, this time as a venture capitalist. Having realized that energy was boring, for a long, long time, uh, going all the way back to the days at Garrett Air Research where I'd worked on Carter administration funded programs. And now it's cool. And let's put that to work. And of course, now I knew that uh, entrepreneurs really create the future. So I was one of the founders of another venture capital firm uh, called Nth Power. I was there for 14 years, took a year off, got really bored and joined CMEA, which uh, is the firm I'm at now. So I've invested in about 30 energy companies, and every single day from every single entrepreneur, you get an education. I had uh, uh, three pitches today, and I'll tell you, it's impossible to get bored in this job. It just can't be done. Uh, even the wacky ones are fascinating people. So that's the be that's, um, that brings us from the beginning to today. A very quick um, commercial for my company, CMEA Capital. Um, it's been around around about 20 years, $1.2 billion under management and seven funds. We have uh, 
three practice areas, life science, information, and energy and materials. I'm in the energy and materials group. And specifically, we look for opportunities that overlap two or even all three of these because since we have specific competencies, really uh, uh, good people in all three of these, we think we can be you know, better than most um, uh, other VC firms uh, at looking at companies that have a mix of energy, uh, energy materials, information, and life sciences. And that's worked well for the company over the years, long before I was there. Um, uh, CMEA out of 880 venture capital firms in the United States is um, number three. Kleiner Perkins Sequoia are the one and two, and CMEA is number three, which we're very proud of and work very hard to maintain. So why do we say energy and materials together? And that goes to an important point I think I'd make about the evolution of the energy sector in the past and in the future, and for the simple reason that energy and materials are fundamentally linked. It's, it's a simple historic fact that for hundreds of years, almost, not quite every, and I'll give you a few examples of the exceptions, but almost every energy advance is triggered by an advance in materials. And you know, there's many, many, many examples, uh, just a few here, you know, um, 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 better steel made better steam boilers, which in turn gave you higher energy efficiency, conversion efficiencies in steam engines. Um, the, one of the real breakthroughs that the Wright brothers made was they were the first ones to figure out how to cast aluminum and make an engine with it, thereby giving a high enough power to weight ratio engine that the aircraft would actually get off the ground. It was a materials breakthrough that nobody else had thought of. Uh, ferromane uranium led to nuclear power. High performance composite lead to uh, wind turbines. You know, solid acids could lead to fuel, fuel cells, and then, of course, anything related to photovoltaics, uh, solar, uh, anything related to batteries. These are fundamentally materials problems, advanced materials engineering problems, and materials processing problems. And so, you know, I don't know what's going to, when it's going to happen and how long it's going to take, but, you know, there's going to be some materials breakthrough that finally makes fusion practical, and then we can all go home with all the rest of the things we're working on. So, um, you know, for the rest of my career and probably for the rest of yours, if you want to look for advances in energy, look for advances in materials. So, um, if you take that as a philosophy and bring it down to um, an investable strategy and put that in market terms, what really rises to the top? And um, We've uh, described five uh, categories of investment interests that I'll go through. Um, I, can t I can give you a list, probably 20 categories long, that's not on here. A lot of the things that you might guess would be on here, we have explicitly excluded for a variety of investment-related reasons. Let's go through the categories that are on here. Uh, first of all, advanced generation. This uh, encompasses everything that most people think of as renewables, solar, wind, tides, geothermal potentially, and so on, and also componentry for such things, uh, generators, gearboxes, so on. Uh, uh, advanced nuclear power uh, is, is uh, becoming very promising. So we have here uh, some examples of companies that we've invested in uh, at CMEA, New Scale Power is a is a uh, modular nuclear power uh, reactor. Uh, Superprotonic is materials, advanced materials for fuel cells. Solyndra is a, uh, a uh, photovoltaic company located down in uh, Fremont, uh, not too far from here. Uh, Danatech is a, um, a high efficiency permanent magnet generator system for wind turbines. What is the common thread that goes through here? And that's cost. The the key to success in the advanced generation sector is only one thing, cost. And the, the utility industry uses the uh, jargon uh, grid parity, which means uh, is utility jargon for as cheap as coal. So I would generally say if you don't have a clear path to get your cost down to grid parity, that is as cheap as coal, 
don't start. Uh, we see lots and lots of business plans in advanced generation that are going to start four or five times the cost of coal and kind of slide along and wait for coal to get more expensive as carbon sequestration adds to the cost and so on. It's hopeless. Uh, grid parity is all that matters. Now, we have another electric power generation, um, uh, electric power category. And if you'll pardon the pun, it's an opposite pole. And that's what we call premium power. And the, the, the idea here is electricity that is made very, very valuable by some market attribute, so valuable that grid parity is left in the dust and doesn't even matter. My favorite example, I'm, I don't know if I'm the only one in the, uh, in the audience uh, who regularly spends $500,000 a kilowatt hour for electricity. Five, half a million dollars per kilowatt hour for electricity for a hearing aid battery. What's the market attribute? Portability, very small, lasts about 10 days. $500,000 a kilowatt hour. Tri AAA batteries are about $3,000. Um, anything that you, uh, related to a computer, if you plug your computer into the wall, uh, charge it up, you spend a tenth of a cent to buy that grid parity electricity off of the grid, but once it's in the computer, it's maybe worth 10 or $20 an hour of runtime. So the, the common thread that runs through everything premium power is very high value, not cost, value because of a market attribute. So these are opposites. And the key here is I've never seen a success in the middle. I've never seen a success where starting in one and migrating to the other. You have to be solidly at one end or at one pole or the other, if you will. Now, here we've got C-Nano. That's a battery materials company. Intermolecular is a, uh, another advanced materials company in the East Bay. Um, tomorrow, this time. Uh, please keep your fingers and toes crossed. A123, which is an advanced battery company, spin out of MIT about eight years ago. It's one of our investments, and uh, it's uh, supposed to go public tomorrow. And uh, it, we're hoping that it will uh, um, break the long dry spell of, uh, uh, of uh, IPOs in, uh, in the clean tech sector. So we're looking forward to that one. So that's our two electric power sectors. Then we move on to what we call future fuels and chemicals. We explicitly don't use the word biofuels because after all, all fuels are biofuels. It's just, you know, did the dinosaur or the um, a microbe, you know, die a couple hundred million years ago or was it a soybean that died last week, you know? So they're all biofuels. We're talking about future fuels and the, the, the key here is we do not invest in production capacity. We want to invest rather in the technology that makes existing produc production capacity economically obsolete. So we um, have here, uh, in the case of Cadexis, an example. Well, this is an interesting company that um, it's over in Redwood City, started as uh, an industrial uh, biotechnology company uh, focused at um, uh, pharmaceuticals. And uh, with our help, when we did the investment, we we realized and convinced them that um, their technology was much more valuable if applied to synthetic fuels. And um, the result is, uh, uh, there's part of this that's public and part that's not. The part that's public is they've done a, a, a very, very significant deal with Shell to uh, make fuel, uh, fuel feedstocks, synthetic fuel feedstocks. The part I can't tell you is how much money it is, but it's actually the largest commercial deal in the history of what is called clean tech. So that's, a, that's going to be a very, very valuable company, I think, all about, about, about making the technology that makes new synthetic fuel feedstocks. Now here's one that we um, just put on the uh, roster, energy efficient products. After having intentionally had it off for a long time, the reason that um, we've had it off was because in my at my previous firm, Nth Power, where I was for 14 years, this is where we lost the most money. Uh, nobody ever says, I love to waste. I'm going to turn the hot water on in the sink and let it run all night because I just love to waste. But you ask people to spend money to save energy, 
really, really tough sell. And I can give you all kinds of stories as to why that has turned out to be true, but the one place that we see that changing is in lighting. And so the company that's mentioned here, Luminous Devices, it's an interesting company. It uh, started out with an, uh, a, a very, very high brightness uh, uh, LED light engine for projection televisions. We're actually going to try to follow the, um, uh, the model set years ago, about 10 years ago. I don't see one in here, but uh, you know the little MR16 halogen reflector lights that are everywhere. Those started out as slide projector lights. And, uh, lamps, and somebody realized, you know, these can be turned into real attractive uh, little uh, area lights. So it made that, that made the transition from uh, projector lamp to area lighting and revolutionized area lighting. We think Luminous is going to do that with their LED light engine. And then last uh, is energy intelligence. Uh, this is one that doesn't um, um, rely on the materials uh, breakthroughs so much. Um, this is applying IT to the energy infrastructure. Um, oil and gas and electricity, you'd think, given the magnitude of the industry, billions of dollars of product moving all over the place, that it would be highly instrumented. They'd know where every barrel is, where every BTU, where every kilowatt hour is. In fact, they don't. It's highly uninstrumented. Uh, you hear a lot about the smart grid but we got a long way to have, go to just have a grid that we you know where all the leaks are. Um, now, interestingly, this is not um, uh, a, a, an investment that we would make for energy efficiency. It's for capital efficiency. The idea here is to figure out how to make more money with the invested capital that's already there. In other words, take the grid, the copper wires that are already strung, and figure out how to push more power through them. That's capital efficiency, not energy efficiency. Um, so that's our five categories. There's a lot that are, on, are not on here. Here we've looked at a lot of water deals. Um, can't see a way to make money. Uh, uh, hydrogen and EV are, are uh, of course, uh, have, uh, are fevers that the public have caught. Can't see a way to make money. And um, so this is what we do for a living. This is what we do. So um, to shift gears a little bit, since uh, uh, I understand I'm your first uh, VC speaker, um, I, I find it's, it's usually kind of interesting to talk about how venture capital funds are structured and what we have to get out of, a, uh, of an investment. And that sets what we can invest in. Um, and it's all about timing. So um, there's two kinds of structures that work, that are at work in a venture capital firm. First of all, um, the management company. You know, I work for CMEA Capital Incorporated. It has an infinite life. You know, that's one of the advantages of having a corporate structure, infinite life. It, it outlives people, right? And, you know, that, that buys the airplane tickets and rents the offices and, you know, all that kind of thing. The funds, however, which actually do the investments, are set up for a variety of tax and legal reasons as limited partnerships. And that one of the main characteristics of a, of, a, of a limited partnership is that it has a predefined finite life. And so that says an investment you're going to do has to be made and wrapped up and sold and the money returned to your investors within that life. And of course, our job is to take money from our investors, make it bigger, and give it back. We have to give it back. So the, the timing graph looks kind of like this. You know, the management company here lives on forever. But a fund has a finite life. And the, the, the standard in the venture capital industry, for no particular other reason other than it's a standard, is 10 years. So. You, you know, you start out at the beginning, you, you close the fund, you raise the money, um, you find the little companies, you work real hard, you raise them up till they're bigger, you get rid of them, to, like A123 tomorrow, it's going to go public, and then we give the money back to our LPs, wrap up the paperwork, and 10 years it's done. So you have, and we're on fund seven. So fund one 
you know, was overlapped a little bit with Fund 2, Fund 3, and they stair step off into the future. We're on Fund 7. So the saying is, you know, if we find a deal that uh, ends war, cures cancer, stops hunger, and makes a billion dollars, and takes 11 years, we can't touch it. And so it also, uh, also part of that is that if you're at the very beginning of a fund, you can afford to do some long ones. Uh, our very first fund, uh, investment in our Fund 7 was a nuclear power deal because we, we have 10 years to harvest that one. But, you know, in your fifth or sixth year, all you're doing is reinvestments in the ones that are already there. So I make a point of this because a lot of folks come to us with plans that simply do not fit the structure. It doesn't mean that it's a bad idea or that um, you know, it's poorly thought out or anything like that. It's just you, know, you can't buy a house on a credit card, you can't get a house loan on a loaf of bread, and you can't do a lot of different kind of business uh, ideas on the venture capital model unless they happen to fit. So at least 50% of the companies we see, we reject because of a timing fit, nothing else. So um, when you're looking for venture capital, keep this in mind. Maybe the business idea you have is a fit. Maybe it isn't. Don't try to force fit it. Now, in term, so the essential question, I've already said this, is can this investment we're looking at be made and exited within the remaining life of the fund that we're investing right now? If the answer is no, it doesn't matter how attractive it is, we can't do it. All right, so uh, investment basics, very, very simple stuff. This is not, not rocket science at all, but you would be surprised how many times uh, a, venture, a, a, a business plan comes into us and one or more of these is just plain missing. We saw over 2,000 business plans in energy and materials last year, and you know there's, there's some really real doozies in there. Anyway, management team. It's all about management team. VC is a bet on the team. Here's a check for $5 million. You've told a great story. We bet you can happen, you can, you can make it happen, and we're here to help. Um, and do they want us as partners? If they want us to give them the check and leave them alone, you know, they can be somebody else's investment. Um, market focus. Very important, especially for those of us who started out life as engineers or scientists, is the business defined in market terms, not technology terms. Why would anybody want this? Who will buy it? Uh, the competitive landscape, is the IP protected? Uh, is there a first mover advantage, stronger weak barriers uh, to entry and stronger weak competitors? What's likely to be the competitive reaction of a well-funded competitor? And what's the deal? Um, you know, I saw a real good one yesterday morning. Um, it should have a pre-money valuation of about $2 million. They're asking for $140 million. Um, uh, you know, they're, you know, two orders of magnitude off. Um, obviously, we won't do that one. Now, specific to universities, there's a couple other questions that I'll, I'll uh, throw out here, um, which I think it may be relevant because some of you would be in the position where you're talking about uh, starting companies that spin out of a university like, you know, like this one, one of the best ones in the world. Uh, focus on returns. What is the team's motivation? Do they want to be wealthy? Often we see university-based teams who say they want to save the planet, and when you ask them about making money, they almost feel embarrassed. That's not the business we're in. <laughs> Keep that in your heart, not in your head. Um, venture capital job is to make money for our investors. Nothing else matters. Um, technology transfer. Is the IP well protected, terms realistic, and can a deal be done quickly? Uh, we were talking about this uh, over coffee. This largely has to do with the tech transfer office or the mechanism that the university has in place uh, to take IP out of a university and bundle it up in such a way that it can be turned into a business. MIT and Stanford are the grandmasters of this. Um, uh, Caltech is a close follow on. Um, the UC system is cumbersome. Uh, most most state-supported schools, regardless of what state they're in, 
tend to be more com more bureaucratic and cumbersome than private ones. Okay. Um, value of information, very important. This is a tough one. Universities disseminate information. They that's what they do for a living. They have meetings like this where they tell people how to do stuff. Companies create value by keeping secrets. And one of the hardest transitions and one of the least successful, generally speaking, transitions is to have someone that's come out of an academic background and try to start a company and have to make that uh, change. We just had a professor we had to let go. He was the founder of the company, but he keeps going to uh, conferences and telling all the secrets. And step on the gas. Universities are paced by the calendar. You know, every week you come to this class and there's the term is over and, you know, no matter how hard, we, and, you know, if you're doing an MBA or engineering or science or so on, you're working like really, really, really hard, but you're not going to try to get it done in half a term rather than a term. Um, success comes in a startup by beating the calendar, not matching it. And then uh, um, push the reject button. If uh, the management team is all scientists or engineers with no prior successes, or if they ask for a non-disclosure agreement, it's usually a uh, dead giveaway that they uh, don't trust uh, outsiders and they're focused on the wrong things. Market focus. Um, the market is so huge, we only need X percent market share and we'll be successful. Um, that's very, very superficial uh, analysis of a market. Um, one party pays, another party benefits. Are we asking one, one, the person that buys a product or a service to write the check, but society at large or another person benefits? Tough sell. Competitive landscape. We have no competitors. Who wants to be in a business with no competitors? It means there's probably no profit there. Nobody else can figure this out. There, if, if there is a good market opportunity, there are billions of dollars and thousands of smart people looking to figure it out. And what's the deal? You know, we see uh, concerns about voting and uh, board control and no discussion of exit plans. So those are, the, those are kind of the rejects. And uh, okay, on to a couple of war stories which illustrate some of these points. An engine control systems company. Um, you know, uh, internal combustion engines are getting very good, very fast, very clean. And here's one out of a, 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 a U.S. university. But the team just doesn't, is not motivated to make money, and they think it's not fair to make money, and it's just not going to go anywhere. That one's going to stay in the university. Fuse cell materials company, this is the one I mentioned, the Caltech. Uh, we just pulled the plug on this one. The technology simply didn't work. After four years of work and about $20 million invested, it didn't work. Um, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Uh, here's a carbon nanotube company. This is another uh, a university spin out. This one happens to be in China. And the advantages here are very, very low cost manufacture of uh, uh, multi wall carbon nanotubes, which are a basic material for uh, lots of different things, including battery electrodes. And uh, a battery company, this is another one, another Caltech spin out. Excellent technology and IP. Uh, the founder, being a professor, was one of the inventors of the lithium ion battery. Being a professor, he published his results and somebody at Sony read it and understood it and ran with it and he didn't make any money. He's not gonna let that happen again. Uh, this one is a huge market and it's, and it's really easy to hire the right people. You can hire the best people in the world. We got it for the CEO of this one, a fellow who's 30 years uh, CEO at Energizer. Uh, nuclear power company, uh, excellent technology and IP, unique in a lot of ways, and just because it's nuclear, it's been hard to raise money. This is going to be a success, but this has been a tooth-pulling exercise. Uh, solar photovoltaics company, excellent technology and IP. It has the best and the worst of Silicon Valley. Um, by that, I mean um, faith that technology will win in a commodity marketplace. <coughs> the commodity is, is grid parity electricity. And it doesn't matter if it's thin film or fat film or whatever kind of film. If it's not cheap, it won't sell. Um, engine Management Systems Company. This is an interesting company in England. It's a spin out of Lotus Cars. Um, this is interesting in, for a variety of reasons. General Motor, or uh, uh, Colin Chapman, um, uh, Formula One racing designer, started Lotus many years ago. General Motors bought it, ruined it, 
then Proton, uh, uh, an Indonesian car, com a Malaysian car company, bought it and ruined it worse. And that means that from this, uh, this center of engineering excellence for everything automotive, there's our huge amount of spin outs, and this happens to be one. It's wa literally walking distance from Lotus cars uh, in, uh, uh, in England, and it's a, uh, uh, a startup with a lot of uh, a management team with a really good success behind them. And an industrial biotech company. I already told you about this. This is the Codexus one. Okay, that was pretty quick. So, um, two suggestions if you want to play in this sector. First of all, um, you have the opportunity that I once had, but I had no idea I had it. Um, that is, um, you know, if you think in terms of the power industry and you make a little avatar, or an icon or something that represents the, the industry, you know, power wires, that goes together. You recognize that. Oil and gas, same thing. And then you start adding a few other things here, like forestry, info, information technology, marine resources, pharmaceutical, biotech, and agriculture. You know, here we are at a university, one of the best in the world. Um, you have most of these things here in, in curriculum, one way or another, in engineering or science or policy. Uh, you know, the real future of energy is, it is going to be, in the next 10 or 20 years, the merging of all these things, the erasing of boundaries. When I, you know, decades ago when we used slide rolls at Oregon State, they had a great engineering school, they had a great agricultural school, but you know, once you get past English comp, those groups of people don't even mix. They listen to different music and they dress differently. You know, what an opportunity to erase the boundaries and when you're in a, in, a, in a situation like a university, learn as much about these other sectors as you possibly can, because I truly believe that the uh, future of energy is the, will be made by the erasing of the boundaries of the traditional sectors. So that's advice number one. Advice number two is send us your business plans. <laughs> and with that, I will take questions. Can you give an example of companies that you invested in uh, that represented uh, integration of those fields that you just mentioned? Mm. Well, uh, sure. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, uh, any, any, anything related to uh, solar photovoltaics is a, a mold melding of infotechnology in the power industry. Anything related to future fuels is agriculture, forestry, marine resources, and oil and gas. But you know, you know, see what I'm trying to say? If, if you study one of those things, or mechanical engineering, or um, physics, or whatever, our educational system sets us up to come out of a place like this with a box drawn around it, ourselves. And my, the point I'm trying to make is, here in a place like this, you have the opportunity at virtually no cost to at least make those boundaries fuzzier. Yes, sir? So yeah, expanding on that, how do you balance the trade-off between specializing in something and expanding your knowledge? Like, I'm sure we'd all love to dabble in every major here, but I mean, we gotta fulfill our major requirements, you know? So like, how do you kind of balance that? That's a difficult question, and I'm not sure I have the answer. But, you know, I would argue, folks, if you're, if you're, if you're in mechanical engineering taking fuels and lubes, you know, like almost every mechanical engineer does, why not take an agricultural economics course too? You know, um, that's, that's I, I, the, the point I'm trying to make is perhaps no, no more profound than that. I know you can't do a, 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 a major in each one of these. Uh, that's uh, what characteristics you have to have to be a successful VC. Um, I get asked that all the time and I will repeat uh, the answer that I got from Arthur Rock, uh, one of the founders of the VC industry, among other things, invested in Apple. When I was sitting in an audience just like this at the Stanford Business School in 1983, and you know, we're all sitting there on the edge of our chairs waiting for his answer, and he says, well, go out and join a couple of startups, uh, have a couple of successes and have a couple of failures, and in 10 or 12 years, come see me. Because it's all about betting on a team 
that they can do it and rejecting the ones that can't. How can you do that if you've never done it? That's, that's one answer. It's not the only answer, but I think it's one of the most valuable ones. And, and uh, over all these years, he's turned out to be right. Well, I'll, I'll, um, you saw up here in, 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 the, in the Citrus building, there's the Floyd Kavama Atrium. Okay. Uh, he was um, a VC. Uh, he's retired now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was a VC at Kleiner Perkins. I asked him that question once 20 years ago. He says, VC's easy. Um, you always ask two questions in the following order. You go into a board meeting, and you sit, the first question you ask is, do we need a new CEO? Now, you, you hope the answer is no, but if it's yes, act quickly because these things never get better with time. Now, if the answer was no, which is what you hoped, then you say, all right, the second question is, between now and the next board meeting, bounded only by ethics and law, what can I do to help? And it can be engineering or personnel or financing or whatever. It's different every day. So a little bit more of the story is under certain conditions, if you, if you have a, um, what you said, something that's about ready to exit in another year or two, um, usually uh, VC fund agreements, the legal documents, have the ability to extend the life of the fund for holding reasons, like you described, but not making any more new investments or anything. The part about buy it with the next fund, that's really tough because the, the, the main issue is um, the set of LPs that's in one fund is almost certainly different than the, the last one. You know, the, in our Fund 6, we had the State of Ohio um, Teachers Retirement Fund. Fund 7, they dropped out, but the State of Nebraska came in. Now, are, are we going to take a Fund six, and 6 investment that just needs a little bit more and rescue it with Fund 7? Uh, how are you going to explain that to your LPs? It's just not practical. Okay. Thanks very much. Yes,